And we're live. So this is a Spheres reading group. Uh, we just started recording. And uh, we are here to discuss chapter three of Bubbles. Uh, the title of this chapter is Humans in the Magic Circle on the Intellectual History of the Fascination with Closeness. And uh, before we get started, um, to make a couple of just uh, announcements, meta remarks, uh, we're not going to have John David Ebert on this call any longer. Uh, and then and today, there's a few other people who expressed they couldn't make it. One of them was Nate Savory, who got a job. And uh, he asked me to relate that he wouldn't be able to make uh, this time anymore. And Michael Schwartz left a comment on, our, on the forum uh, to the effect that he can't make this call today. Uh, because of um, an issue with uh, a move that he's uh, uh, undergoing right now. Uh, so uh, we have myself, Ed Mahood, Donna Abadi, John Davis, uh, and Wendy Runs Baker. And um, I thought I would get started by, uh, well, a couple things. Uh, one is just a meta reflection uh, on this conversation in relation to other conversations that, uh, that we've recently had, we in the larger sense of participants in Infinite Conversations Forum and uh, in, in this reading group. And then uh, see if I could lead that toward uh, asking some more, maybe taking, taking this opportunity insofar as uh, the configuration of our sphere, if you will, has, uh, has changed. Uh, and we've done now three calls, uh, so we have some material to work with in terms of our own engagement with each other and with the text. So taking an opportunity to reflect on our own process or experience as a group to see if we can uh, clarify it, uh, improve it, uh, and see what we're actually learning from these conversations and how we would wish to proceed with them uh, in order for them to be most uh, useful or most fulfilling or to, to even define what our goals uh, and desires for this space and for this activity are. So I want to start though by reflecting that uh, on Tuesday, a couple days ago, uh, Ed, Caroline and myself uh, did a call on, uh, on the Tuesday call that I started doing Infinite Conversations Live with uh, a fellow named Sperry Andrew, Andrews. And the topic of that call was, uh, was the title of it, if we were to label it, name it, was our being uh, a, a commonly or um, tapping into a commonly sensed consciousness. I may not have actually literally said that correctly, but the idea of the call was that we uh, faced each other in this virtual space. And um, after some introductory words, uh, I let Sperry guide us into this exercise that he has developed over the years which essentially involved um, bringing our attention collectively to the, uh, what the, common, the common space, the common consciousness, the common arising uh, between us right there in that, in that moment. Uh, and it was an interesting uh, experiment. We went through it for a couple of hours. And after, uh, after it was done, I continued to reflect on it and thoughts came up. Uh, even up, you know, up until today. Um, but I made the connection that part of what we were attempting to do there, which we may or, not, may or may not have done successfully, I think that for me it was a difficult process actually. And I have some, uh, I may have, I have some specific uh, uh, reflections on that call itself. Mm. But, uh, but part of what we were doing is, is trying to sense something in common, trying to sense what was common between us in real time, in real space, in that precise, non-local uh, togetherness. Uh, and in, in, that's really what we're talking about. Uh, one of the things that is essential to what we're talking about in the Spears reading, and in particular in this chapter, uh, because the, the theme of this chapter, Humans in the Magic Circle, has to do with the emergence of a sense of the way that we affect each other in groups, uh, how, we, how our affects, as Solardek said, become infectious, and what are the mechanics or the dynamics of how that occurs and how we experience that. 
Uh, and I, I don't want to quite get into the, uh, the a, a sort of summary or a text-based discussion quite yet, but only to invoke that what we're reading about in this chapter, which is essentially group dynamics and the depth psychology of, of group dynamics and the maybe limitations of that, uh, or of, that, of that, those languages uh, that Sloterdijk presents us with in these successive illustrations. Um, that's what we're engaging with here. Uh, and so how could we use the text to reflect on uh, our own engagement in this moment, in this actual face-to-face uh, co-present uh, encounter that, that we're all in? How can we keep our attention on the actuality of it at the same time, perhaps using these texts and other conversations that we've been having uh, in the forum as well, uh, for example, the topics on post-humanism, on cybernetic uh, awareness, on shared leadership, on collaboration, uh, on metaphors, and the way the the language, the, the ways in which the metaphors that inform the language that we use affect the way that our our spaces allow us to, uh, or uh, allow us to uh, interface uh, with each other. I'm interested in, in those questions and. I'd like to get ultimately to some fundamental sense, a real sense, not just the theoretical uh, sense in terms of an interpretation of something else, but a real sense of, of, of some of fundamental questions that transcend the book. Uh, and that I don't, I, I don't have a, a predefined answer, to, uh, but I want to point to that space. Uh, and the questions are, who are we? Where are we? What are we doing? And why? And uh, can I, can, can, uh, yeah, so with that, I will open it up to uh, some reflections and to us affecting each other as we will. Can I ask you a question, Marco? Sure. With all of that, what? For this session to be really useful for you, this session will be like what? <laughs> yeah, I, I can say that it will feel, uh, it will feel that we've truly uh, exchanged something. Feel that we have truly exchanged something. Exchanged something. And for you to feel that we have truly exchanged something, you will be like what? <laughs> I will be like an empty vessel, I think. Oh, you will be like an empty vessel. That's the thought that came to mind uh, without thinking it before I said it. And what resources do you have or what, uh, support you need for you to be a vessel? I think I only need you all to uh, per participate as you will. You, you need you all, us all, <laughs> to participate. Okay. I as think we that's will. The, yeah. <laughs> I think for me, that's very good information. So I will know what you, what would be useful for you in this particular session we're having today. And I'm sure each of us could answer in a very unique way what would be most useful. Um, I'm open, I need open curiosity from the group so that I can relax and be as weird as I need to be in order for me to share what I believe is best in myself and uh, rather than fall into a kind of defensive posturing where I feel like, okay, I have a handle on this and I can present it in a certain way. I would much rather go into directions where I don't have a, I don't think any of us have a very good map for this particular territory in this particular chapter. I've had a lot of experience with hypnosis. I was uh, trained as an Ericksonian hypnotherapist and I've worked with a lot of people, 
over many years. So this isn't something that um, I'm a novice or a beginner. I'm actually, I would consider myself an expert, but that doesn't mean around some people, I wouldn't be an expert at all. There are some people who are much more advanced than I am. So for me, for this session would be really useful for me. I would be um, clarifying some of my own thoughts and feelings about hypnosis, mm -hmm. generative hypnosis, what trance is. And if we know what trance is, we'll know a lot of, a whole hell of a lot about who we are. Mm. Because I believe trance is a, is a very natural occurrence, everyday kind of thing. You can plop yourself in front of a TV and go into a trance. That's what I would call probably low level trance. Or you can have trance states which are tremendously um, impactful and, and uh, you know, create a lot of learning. Um, so I'm open to that and I would like to create conditions for those kinds of learning events to occur. So, um, so that's sort of uh, what I would like to have happen in this mm. session. And I think that just to state very quickly, <laughs> simply what it is we'd like to have happen, we may actually have some of that happen, maybe not. We're in a group and a lot of agendas may be here. Some of the agendas we have may be quite unconscious or out of our awareness, but obviously we have a curiosity about this text. And uh, I think it could be uh, useful as a feedback so that we can look back and reflect on this session and say, oh, well, I got some of this, I got some of that, I missed that, uh, this is the next step for me, and maybe this could be something I could contribute to the group uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that sounds very good to me. Mm -hmm. I would like to help support that. Uh, Thank I like you. To, yes. <laughs> I need the support, believe me. It's a very difficult <laughs> subject. And Slaughtered, uh, our author, I think, has done a great deal to uh, flesh out some of this. And I don't think he simplifies it either. I think he shows that how complex it is and how what a complex and convoluted history hypnosis has had, mesmerism, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Are we all in a trance? Uh, shall we? <laughs> oh, no, no. no. From, from We're all enjoying it. I don't know if you allow me to share a personal experience. Please. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I think John mentioned, I, don't, I can't remember which session when he talked about uh, when he went back to ancient Rome. Well, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. But actually, I was always wondering what brought me to this group and why I'm reading Bubbles. And um, after reading chapter three, and I have to uh, also say that I went through chapter four a little bit. And then it shocked me because, I don't know, in a way, I find some answers for why I'm here and why I'm reading this book and why I am with this group. Um, years ago, I did uh, myself, I don't know, uh, um, uh, past life regression, something like that. I went through this experience and I was in search of questions, the questions that Marco said, why I'm here, and I had certain fears which I couldn't explain. I did a lot of things, did meditation, did yoga, uh, went to a psychiatrist and did many things. But then um, I tried this past life regression. I did it myself and many people told me you shouldn't do it yourself, you should go to an expert. And I was surprised actually because, I don't know if it was a real experience, because I saw myself in a temple, ancient civilization in Ashtar. And from that day, I started to read more about who's Ashtar, why Ashtar, why it came to me, do I, would I find answers there? And uh, yeah, I mean, when I'm reading Bubbles, I thought maybe this is one of the things that are coming my path and maybe still years and years to come. And yeah, I, until now, I don't know what is my being, what is my existence, but I think my being is through you through this group. I can see myself through you. I exist through this conversation. I mean, um, I believe in Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh existed for me when he met Enkidu. The moment Gilgamesh met Enkidu is the moment he realized that he is Gilgamesh. And this is how I see it. I mean, I see myself when I see Marco. 
this is my being, this is how I explain my being. Um, I cannot see myself uh, existing alone or that's why when he mentioned in chapter three this relationship between the two and this is where you feel your ex your being your existence i mean yes um, this is what yeah I mean, these are my personal reflections on my readings and on this group and yeah is there anything if i may ask uh, yes is there what resources do you have or what uh, support do you do you need so that this uh, can happen? In terms, on support in terms of what? Well, you mentioned um, past life regression. And yes, yes, actually um, I've read, I've read seeing, material. Mesh and all that. Yes, 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 seeing, I've read. Seeing others. Uh, yes, yes, it, I was surprised. I was really surprised. And then I thought maybe it was a dream. And I didn't know if it was really I went through this experience. Or did I succeed because I'm not an expert, you know, uh -huh. but I had to try. I, I'm a person who tries many things. <laughs> so this is one of the things that I tried. And I never went back to do it again, because um, the, the, the experience was very intense for me, you know. And uh, it explains many things. And um, I don't know, I stopped after that. I said, may maybe, I said, maybe I shouldn't go there. Maybe I need an expert, which till now, I, I mean, I didn't find. And in modern day psychiatry, I don't find answers at all. Never, Yanni, I have to say. <laughs> I hear you. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I find answers in art. That's why I write. I find answers. I always say that answers to us, humanity is in art. I don't know. I mean, many people say science, technology. I don't believe in that at all. Definitely, it's art. Definitely. Maybe this, I'm speculating here, and I haven't heard everybody else, but I think this is a, a pat, maybe not a meta, meta pattern or a meta, but I think there's a theme here about art. And, yeah. uh, and uh, we seem to be attracted to art and to science, but I think I, I, I share those values with you. Um, mm. How art mm very central to my way of mm. figuring out what's going on. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. You're here. Mm. <laughs> but, you know, it, it times to, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just quickly say, I just said here, here, I just almost wanted to mm. affirm like, as if we were rallying support for a, for a cause. Uh, but, uh, and I quickly questioned that in, my, in myself uh, because I realized how, uh, how contentious that that argument can be uh, between the art and what's legitimate in terms of experience and what's legitimate in terms of communication, what's okay to share, what's not okay to share, uh, in what kind of spaces you can uh, do that, uh, what kind of support you have to do that. Uh, what does that mean, support in terms of how you're maybe, how you might be framing it or not framing it? Is it a therapeutic situation? Is it an exploratory situation? Um, I, uh, but the theme of art, I will say though, is, is always ends up feeling good to me. <laughs> it always ends up feeling liberating to me in a way that other discourses, mm. other uh, forms or uh, understandings of a, of a sense of purpose uh, don't. Uh, and uh, that I fully acknowledge may be a character, characterological uh, trait. Uh, Somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, the, the physicist, uh, may not ex exp explain it that way or uh, uh, articulate it in those terms. And, and he may really see science as an art. And, and maybe there's some fusion that, that we could talk about you know, in, in, in these discourses. Uh, that's something that I think is uh, interesting. Maybe one of the, it's maybe one of the things that Solarek is clearing a space for, that we're clearing a space for in our reading. Uh, if we can see the discourses, the narratives, the metaphors that have kind of bound us, the binding energy. That's one of the uh, themes that comes up uh, through Giordano Bruno in, in this chapter. We can see what's binding us uh, and disentangle it or loosen it a bit. That could give space for a more fluff, a more comfortable and enjoyable, I hope, ex expression of, of these kinds of experiences like, like you've related, which I don't know how to interpret. Uh, I really don't, um, but I didn't even know you had it before you shared it. <laughs> so um, now that it's in the space. Did we, did we lose you, Marco? Uh, I guess still, he'll be back. 
I'm still talking. No, I can still, Maybe I can I can still hear you. Oh. I still hear you loud and clear. Okay. John, you're frozen. Your video yes. frozen. Ah, we lost John. Yeah. He'll be back. Yeah. Okay. So, John, if you can still hear us, uh, seems to work as... Oh, okay, you're moving again. <laughs> so, <laughs> Don't, I love technology. I was moved to, I was moved to respond. <laughs> Uh, and um, that's good. Uh, do, can you speak, John? Can we? Can you just check your? Sure. Okay, just making sure we can got hear. Got me. You. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got lost in yeah. cyberspace temporarily. <laughs> Glad yeah. to be back. Oh, it's good to have you. Thank you. <laughs> um, speaking of arts and, and science, did, do you do you folks know that the University of Oxford only awards arts degrees? If you study physics, you get a BA. They don't offer bachelors of science. Wow. They're only arts. Mm. Because traditionally in the university, there were only arts. Originally. There was the, the trivium, the, the, the grammar, the dialectics, the logic. And then there were the four major arts, the quadruvium, that, that were was music and geometry or actually math and arithmetics uh, that was in there. Um, don't ask me about the other two because they just slipped out of my... Uh, was it rhetoric? <clears throat> uh, no, was that was in the first three. There's rhetoric, grammar, and... Um, logic. And uh, logic with a, with, with a three, let's call them... It was called the trivium. You had to do those three, and once you passed those, you went on and you studied four other, other subjects it, and it was, well, it, basically philosophy, geometry, arithmetics, uh, arithmetic, and um, music, and astronomy. And you did those four. And when you were done, then you were, you were awarded a degree. The first three, having done the first three, you were awarded a bachelor's, so to speak. It was a, it's a title. It just means that you are an independent person. <laughs> That's what a bachelor actually means. You're an independent person. And if you did the other, the other four, then you were a master. And that, that curriculum of seven subjects, of course, was very much uh, dictated by the church and the, the, the numerology of number seven and the seven days of creation and seven cardinal sins and seven virtues and seven vices, that whole that whole seven, a lot of that played into it, into it. But the original universities were structured that way. And when you had that, that, that master's, then you could go on if you wanted to become, which also means teacher, uh, that was, but it was a lesser teacher. It was the magister, like in Magister Ludi. If you, if you read um, uh, Hermann Hesse's, um, what do they call it in English? The glass bead game. It's actually called the, the master of the game. Is, can I ask you a question, Ed? Sure. Is there, oh, yeah. is there a relationship between being a master and being a magus? No. Yes. He, he talks <laughs> about, he talks yeah. about the magus, and I was thinking, yeah. is that like a super duper sorcerer magician? Well, Jack that's 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 a that's a whole that's a, that's a whole other ball of wax, as we used to say, but. But th this was just within that, that academia. This is that formal learning situation kind of thing. Uh, so Magus usually was not in an academic no, setting. No, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, but everything, the interesting thing about it, the interesting thing about it, um, originally, it used to take seven years to get a doctorate. And, and one of the, <laughs> oddly enough, then they wanted you to study for seven years and it took you seven years to get through this first curriculum and things like that. Because the sevenness has, has an, in, an extremely important effect on all of us, all of our lives. Um, there, there are very clearly delineated physio-psychological developments that take place within the first seven years of a human being's life. Those first seven years are absolutely critical. There are a number of uh, educational theorists. I happen to belong to this school of thought, if you will. I think it's right that says that children should not be sent to school before the age of seven. And at the age of 14, which is that second year phase, 
that second seven year phase of life, that's when people became, were confirmed or in the church, for example. It is the, in uh, Germany, it is still the fact that at, even though you politically, legally come of age when you're 18, you become religiously of age when you're 14. And so religious instruction, for example, is a subject in German schools. But if a child of 14 says, I don't want to take that, their parents can't make them because they are already mündisch. That means they are allowed to speak for themselves in relation to that matter. And that is legally binding. And this took place when you were 14. And this was also the age that people very often entered into apprenticeships. This is when they, they left home, they were sent out. And apprenticeships, if you were, if you were to, to go through an apprenticeship, if you wanted to become a cobbler or a cooper or a furrier, whatever it was, it, it would take you, if you wanted to become a master, which they still have in Germany, it takes you seven years to do that. So you go through this apprenticeship, you become a journeyman, and in that journeyman time, you travel, you wander, you go about, you learn. And on the basis of those handicrafts, the university system was modeled after that. And that's why we call them masters now, because when you became a master craftsman, you, you did, your, your final exam was literally a masterpiece. You had to, if you were a, a, a let's say a, a cabinet maker, you had to produce a cabinet that other cabinet makers would acknowledge as being worthy of the guild. And that was your masterpiece. So this, and all of these words that we have are words that we find in art. Because up until that time, there was no distinction between art and technology and, and, and writing and science. That's, that's something that came much, much later when we split that all apart. And that, that came up Francis Bacon and the rise of science, this whole idea of, of finding some kind of an objective way to, to grasp reality. Those, that's a very, very, very new thing. And, and for me, it's always difficult to separate, well, what, where is the art? You know, you can, I can watch a cook on TV and be brought to tears by what they can do. Or a person who is making a cabinet, just like I can when I, when I listen to a lecture by someone who, who says something that is so utterly profound to me that it, move, it moves me. There's an emotional connection to all of this, you see. So I don't, I don't have that easily accessible, I'm going to divide myself into little fragments that I can do here and I can, I can see this and I can see that. And so I very much appreciate um, this, this whole art thing because, because it is so important and it's so essential. It's actually the fundamental part of all, in it, all of it. And when you go back to Greece and the ancient Greeks, if, in Aristotle, when he starts talking about arts and making things, he's talking about techne which is where our word technology comes from. <laughs> because it's simply something that we do. It's, and, and from that come things like techniques and not just technology, the techniques themselves. And those are also very important. It's all, all intimately bound up with one another that I, I sometimes, and this is the problem I have with Slotted, I, I don't want to take this too far away from the text, is that he utterly, in my mind, confuses all of this and goes on and on about things that are very inspirational in, in small moments when I'm reading, but that are so absolutely aggravating. I, can't, I cannot begin to express to you folks how angry I get when I'm reading this text. I actually, my, it's not the worst for wear, but this book has flown through the room more than once. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I wish you had <laughs> you know, I'm not taking it lightly, but I still don't get it, you see? But because I think, I think he's obfuscating things that are, for me, and I understand that this is, this is a misconception on my part, patently obvious, you see? But, but then again, then I have to stop and say, okay, Ed, well, you do have a little different view of the world than a lot of people that you know. And you shouldn't expect that others would share that. And, and, and then I go, okay, okay, well, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you another try. And I'll go back to the next discussion. I'll learn something. I'm sure. because, because that's why I come here. Because I am 
absolutely and utterly fascinated by how taken all of you are by this book. <laughs> pisses me off to know that And I just find that fascinating. Uh -oh. I am curious about something. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things that Sloterdijk talks about in this chapter is the effect of the philosopher priests or you know, words uh, on an audience. And he tells this whole story of, uh, of, of Fichte's use of and his interest in mesmerism uh, mm -hmm. to um, mm -hmm. initiate his readers and his listeners when he would do talks into uh, this higher consciousness, this kind of self uh fulfilled uh, consciousness in the, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the kind of, tr in the, in the worldview or in the, in the mode of German ide idealism and, mm -hmm. and the romanticism of the fusion of, uh, or the removal of the kind of transcendence of boundaries as consciousness becomes aware of itself as consciousness <laughs> through consciousness. Uh, and so uh, that seems to be one of the things that's happening with the book is that there is an effect uh, we're, aff we're affected uh, yeah. by, by it uh, oh, yeah. more in the the sort of sphere, lighter a lighter mood a lighter mm -hmm. mode uh, yeah. and, and some <laughs> more uh, negative it's a react a reaction uh, and so I'm interested in that and I'm noticing mm -hmm. that and I, I do I, I do have a specific question uh, to follow yeah. up on the curiosity before I get to that question uh, I'll, I'll just introduce uh, offer a personal anecdote to connect with yours. We're homeschooling our, our daughters, mm -hmm. two daughters. One of them is seven years old uh, and the other is three. And uh, before we had them, we had already decided that we were going to homeschool them. Uh, and one of the books that we have in our library is, uh, is I don't remember the exact title, but it's a guide to classical education. And the, the sequence of learning, uh, the sort of curriculum, uh, set out in that book goes through the trivium that you mentioned, and I was mistaken what I in what I interjected when you were uh, describing it. It goes from uh, it goes from grammar mm -hmm. to logic to rhetoric, yeah. and the grammar cycle uh, is all concrete learning, uh, memorization, facts, uh, just knowing what to call things, how the world is ordered in a pre-given way. The logic is learning the rules. Uh, it's learning, it's taking an abstract perspective on objects. Uh, and then the rhetoric is applying those rules and then ultimately being able to influence through one's uh, mastery uh, of the phenomena and of the way that those phenomena work and are put together. And so that's where the artistic, I think, movement uh, comes in. And that's also part of what uh, Sloterdijk is involved in course, as well. I mean, part of his I think style is highly rhetorical. Uh, and in the, in the sense that we would mean it today, uh, in addition to the sense of how uh, a classicist might uh, look at the term. But they're all, you know, I, I, I was starting to, and I was starting to question this. Why was I, I was starting to feel like, what is he actually talking about? The question mm -hmm. I have for you actually is yeah, okay. um, the curiosity because I, I, maybe you infected me. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> uh, but I wondered, okay, uh, we see that there's this play of affects, there's this infectious uh, play of energies, there's this magic uh, effect uh, that we're familiar with through our reading of Gebser. We, we talked a bit about that. Uh, and, um, and this is obvious in some, certain, in some sense, right? But what, what is it that you think he's obfuscating? Uh, like what, what is he pointing out? What is he... Or what is he not pointing out? Uh, what is he dis distracting from? Uh, that may be that sort of, that may be more commonly sensed in the sense of what he's actually talking about or what he would purport to be talking about. Okay. I started reading this under the assumption that I was going to be reading a philosophical text. So it turns out, and this, this came out in our very, on our very early discussions online as well, that this spherology is not an ology at all. It, it, was, it was a trick. He uses this as an image in order to 
to bring us in, which is legitimate. I'm not arguing that. But he's not developing a science of space. He's not really, he's not really exploring, well, how does spatialness enable us to become together? The other thing that, that bothers me about it is I would expect from a scholar of, of even minimal quality. I, I was involved in, in higher education for a number of years and I've had lots of students. And we had very, very high standards as to scholarship, quoting your sources, making things known, where you brought, brought in ideas from other places and whatnot. And Slaughter Dyke doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Slaughter Dyke is a person who goes through making, from my sensibilities, wild generalizations about things and never, never, never stops to say, and I think this because, or other people think like I do, and I agree with them. He also is not averse to simply making stuff up as if it were true and inserting it into his presentation. The, the first example where that came up is when he talked about Plato's Academy in the very introduction, where at the beginning and the end of the introduction, it was all about excluding. How do you get the dumb plebes out of this so that those of us who are actually worthy of understanding what's going on can interact with one another? And he comes up to this thing where there's this second inscription above the doors of the academy. Well, first of all, the academy never had doors. The, the inscription that was allegedly inscribed there was first mentioned a thousand years after the academy was formed. None of that's ever mentioned. He presents this as this, this is fact. And if you're reading a philosophical text, you expect, well, this person is going to give me some genuine information. But, he, but he's not. And so that's the obfuscation. He, but he really doesn't tell you where he got them or why. And with that second inscription, it doesn't exist at all. He made it up. There's not a shred of evidence anywhere. I've spent hours looking for things. Nothing. Nowhere. And I'm going, okay, you make it up as you go along. And then I sit down and I read this this clay vessel interpretation he makes out of Genesis where he goes, and the Hebraicists tell us, but there's not a footnote. And I can tell you, I'm studying biblical Hebrew for the last three years. The Hebraicists don't say that at all. They don't even come close to what he was saying. And so I'm going, okay, well, I doubt this. And, and, and I know not everyone was there, but one of the the things that came up in the other conversation, and I've mentioned this in a, in a posting on the forum, when I have people who are like experts on consciousness, like, like Daniel Dennett, who says consciousness is illusion, don't believe it, it's a trick. And this person is telling me this, then you're actually telling me, well, don't believe me, I'm, I'm performing a magic trick for you. But it's actually not a magic trick because I have a whole different understanding of magic than what Mr. Schlager I has. I've, I've known real live magicians and I don't mean magicians like stage magicians who pull rabbits out of hats. People who sit down and, and consciously, for their understanding of this, change the course of their lives through magical acts. And this is, and this is nothing like what Slaughter Dyke is talking about. So I have this, this other side of experience where I'm going, well, well, don't you know about any of that? Because he never mentioned it. And then... And, and the other thing that then, then bothers me, if, since I'm on a roll, I might as well say it, <laughs> is this, this, these procrustean examples that he pulls out. Of all the pictures in the world to describe faciality, he picks one where there's, there's, there's a shit happens image out of Forrest Gump between Joachim and you know, the Virgin Mary. And his, the, his description of the the Christ-Judas interaction and faciality literally li reads like the neo-Nazi uh, uh, party, pro um, what do you call that, uh, a manifesto that, that, they, that they put out about, of course, these are all ugly Jews, and we have to do something about it, because look at this Aryan Christ who's uh, rising above everything else, painted by a guy in 13, whatever it is, so... How else would he 
how else would he draw him? Because everybody knows that the Jews killed Christ. You see, and, and none, of, none of this ever seems to pop up anywhere because he's, he's so wrapped up in showing you what he knows. This, this is the other thing that bothers me. You know, he's always telling us, to me at any rate, well, if you don't get this, it's because you're just, you're just not the right person to be getting it. And maybe you should be rethinking that. He also did that, for example, in relation to Ficino when he did that love story thing with the vapor flowing, whatever it was, which is one theory of how inter human interaction takes place around this. Well, it was a little later in Shakespeare's time. They believed that you were love at first sight was because Cupid shot arrows through the pupils of your eyes and reflected off the back of your skull and struck your heart. Well, there's no vapors in that. That, that was a combative weapon that was being used, but somehow it was in another realm and not seen, or, but the effects were felt. And, and none of these things, he excludes everything that doesn't fit. And he makes everything that he has fit into what he's trying to tell us. And I, I find that just too forced. You know, it's not, that's not my idea of presenting a convincing argument. Whereby, and this is, this is part of what fascinates me, I can see along the way how at any one point somebody could say, you know, this makes me think of that. And you go off thinking about it. That's one of the things that aggravates me because I go off thinking about stuff and I'm trying to be aggravated at the guy. <laughs> because that's, that's what got me going. But I do think about these things. And I do think about other things, but I don't think that's the way you, you develop a philosophical argument. So I'm still wrestling with the disappointment, you see, of being told this is what's going to happen and something else is going to happen. Yeah, can, can yeah, you can interrupt me at any time you want. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to interrupt you. Very interesting what you're saying. I just wanted to, I don't want to get polarized around this. No. Because I find he is sort of, a, and he is ambiguous. And so is a lot of the stuff he's talking about. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So I'm just, um, I give, I cut him a little bit of slack because I think this, the, what he's trying to describe is uh, very difficult and um, it is ambiguous and it, um, and he can obfuscate, I think the word is. Um, but I think because he also comes up with some marvelous sentences, I think yeah. I just wanted to share one, but first of all, I, not everyone on this call has had a chance to speak and I know Wendy hasn't said anything. So I just want to <laughs> press the pause button before I offer what I wanted to offer because I'm curious if, if Wendy is, uh, if anything is coming up for her. Hello, Wendy. I haven't heard from you at all in all of these talks. <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> well, no, it's just been interesting because you're right. I listen a lot on these calls. Um, I listen to learn different things. Um, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that have come up just as I was listening to, uh, to add and to all of you, you know, kind of give your feedback on what was going on. Um, it, it kind of in response to what Ed was saying, I mean, my feeling towards Slaughter Dyke right now is he's looking at the world and explaining it and interpreting the art and interpreting uh, human interaction and space, you know, in a way that makes sense to him. So yes, I mean, I, I definitely see Ed's point where there's a lot of stuff that we, that we know, you know, because we're all scholars in our own way. We've all researched and read different things. And there, I'm, like you, Ed, I've got some certain things that are just, you know, obvious to me. Like, this is how I understand magic. This is how I understand consciousness. This is how I understand physics. Um, but, you know, part of the reason I'm in groups like this and I read books like Bubbles is let me hear somebody else's perspective on this. Um, because I know for one, again, this is part of the reason I do these groups is I never think like anybody else does. I, I will read this book and come away with something completely different than the four of you will. And at least in this group, I can say it. Like John was saying, I can be weird if I want to and I can say some of these things. I can't do that with my everyday friends because <laughs> it's so far beyond the realm of their consciousness. I can't even get into it. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's why, why I have, I have these kind of conversations. 
Um, and like I said, because I always, always, always interpret things completely different than the other people in the room, I don't get as upset reading Slaughter Dyke's interpretation because I'm like, okay, here's just one other guy who's at least he's, he, at least he is interpreting it and can explain it and tell a story about why he thinks this way. You know, I try to have those conversations with other people and, I, and like when they're spouting off about something and I'm like, well, you know, why do you really think that? Like, what's the basis of it? What is, where does that come from? Does it come from your religion? Does it come from your education? Does it come from your, where you grew up? And they're like, you can never get past that. They're like, ah, this is just the way that it is. I don't understand why people don't think this way. And I'm like, people don't think this way because you can't explain why you think that way. <laughs> you know, give me something here to go off of and I'll, I'll you know, listen to you for another 10 minutes and think maybe you've got something valuable. But usually they end up not having a basis for their thoughts whatsoever. And then we change the subject and, you know, we never come back to that. So, <laughs> um, so I, I listen a lot because I'm like, well, you know, this is how I interpreted it. And, you know, as Marco knows, and I think as Ed knows me a little bit, I always try to bring it back towards, well, how can I use this? So right. if this is the way he's thinking about the world, is there anything in here I can take with me today? You know, when I get off this call and I walk out the door and I go to my next thing, is there any of that I can take with me to help facilitate my interaction with other humans or that conversation in the bar with the guy who can't explain why he thinks a certain way? And um, sometimes I can take it with me and sometimes I can't. <laughs> Enough. Thank you, Wendy. Can can I add something now? I just want to be. Is this okay? Is this a good time? Yeah. Something that was said earlier, Ed. You talked about magic, and you knew you knew magicians, and you knew that they had created the conditions for a real some in, something impactful in their life or someone else's life. I wanted to explore that a little bit further with you, but before I do, I just wanted to quote our author here. And, um, and the piece of text that he, it's a really sh a brief paragraph, I quote him, and then I wanted to reflect on something, um, not from my own experience, but from someone else's experience. And then we maybe leap into something else about what you were talking about. Um, okay, I, I hope this is for the usefulness of everybody here. Um, the quote is, he's talking Can about, can you oh, the page? Uh, so, so Ed's got the German edition. He may right. That's why I'm going to see if I can yeah, find I it. Um, if you give me a, I'd have to look it up. Um, oh, okay. You were you copied it down. Yeah, okay. I had written I had written the quote down. Oh, okay. I can find. Don't worry. It. Um, it's in here somewhere. Uh, that's, that's okay. Just, let just me read it. I'll find it later. I'm going to quote just part of it, and I'll okay. find the page number for you later. But that's he's awesome. talking about. Okay. Um, Every human organism, and he's making a claim here, hmm. um, each one holds a memory that preserves its days in the mother's womb and to which, under extraordinary circumstances, such as those created by mag magnetopathic treatment, they can return in an informative way. This possibility of return was the decisive condition of the new healing art. The patients of magnetism remembered a state of their selves, as it were, in which they were animated and coordinated from the center of the mother in the mode of ecstatic vegetability. Now, I think that is a bit obscure, his language, ecstatic mm -hmm. vegetability. Um, and I remember what Freud said about, uh, he was talking to a poet who was, I think it was an English poet whose name I can't remember, but it was hanging out with the Indian sage uh, Ramakrishna. Mm -hmm. And um, he was talking about these experiences of uh, oceanic bliss he would have around this particular sage. And Freud said, well, I wasn't there. I've never had this experience, but I can assure you it's just a regression to the oceanic bliss of the mother's womb. Um, but I'm going to tell a, 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 something that I read about from a gynecologist, Bernard Cheek, who is also a student of Milton Erickson, who is a great a psychiatrist and probably the greatest uh, hypnotherapist who ever lived. Bernard Cheek had a patient who could not become fertile. She wanted to become pregnant. So he put her into a, a trance and he used idiomotor signals you know, like a, one finger says yes, another finger says no, another finger says I don't know. And uh, in the trance state, he asked what was the cause for this infertility. And he reported 
that in the womb, her mother had tried to abort her, her the embryo, with a hat pin. And so he thanked her unconscious, whatever, and he brought her back into the room and reoriented her and said, thank you very much. He did not believe that this was possible because he thought that the nervous system isn't developed enough to have any kind of response like that. And uh, he had a belief system that was very much like, this is an impossibility. Um, the woman, uh, I think it was uh, shortly after that, he received a letter from the patient's mother. And she said that she had indeed attempted to abort her daughter in utero with a hat pin. She had never told anyone about this. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Cheek had to then start, you know, he had a lot of cognitive dissonance because he said, well, this isn't supposed to be something that's possible, but he had to like have an open, curious mind. And he, he started to wonder about his own presuppositions about what's mm -hmm. possible, what's not possible, what's real, what's unreal, what's imaginary, um, what's fiction. And I, I find this a very compelling kind of counter argument to, I think, maybe what our author is talking about, this uh, ecstatic vegetal, what do you call it, this vegetable bliss, <clears throat> mm -hmm. or what Freud was talking about, this uh, regression to the uh, oceanic bliss of the womb. Because for some people, the womb is not a blissful place. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's fraught with peril. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of uh, biochemical stuff going on as well as you can hear the mother's digestion, you can hear her talking, you can hear your, her talking to your father, you can hear, um, and we know a lot more about prenatal psychology, what's happening, than Freud, Freud did. Slaughter's like, I don't think there's any excuse, but I may be taking them out of context here. But I'm just thinking, these are the kinds of ways I'm using this text, yeah. not looking for successful arguments. Mm -hmm. rational mm -hmm. arguments, because they're very few, if any. Maybe, maybe at the end of the book, I'll look back and reflect. And <laughs> right now, I agree with you. A lot of it is obscure. Uh -huh. And there, it may be some obfuscation, um, some mistakes. But I think he's trying to do something very big. And he's going to make a lot of mistakes. And I uh -huh. think he, he's expecting us to fill in a lot of the details. Because uh -huh. this is already three volumes. <clears throat> And it'd be a whole lot longer if he, and I think he's trying to keep a, a manageable pace going. And for me, I was, my attention was very much held by this. Mm -hmm. I think he had enough, uh, a lot of the stuff I know about, uh, Mesmer and uh, Pusiger, I believe is the, mm -hmm. one of the authors, who was sort of a, a study with Mesmer, but he was a, a wealthy guy who had a, mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, uh, he, he got his, uh, stable boy actually he put a stable boy into trance and he found out his stable he had a very interesting case history about his stable boy because on one level it was a very stupid man peasant uneducated but when he put him into a trance a brilliant insightful majestic personality came through so i think these are very interesting that these sub personalities that we can talk about now um Every culture has had to deal with them, but we, but they have been labeled and dismissed or labeled and included in very different ways. So anyway, you were talking about magic and impactful experiences that you had noticed. I was just wondering if you, is there, is there anything else about that that you might want to describe? If you're willing to, I mean, maybe it's something you wouldn't want to talk about, but, but I'm very curious about that. Uh, no, uh, there's nothing that I, that I feel in addition to or, or wouldn't want to include um, the people that, 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 um, that I know that, that take this approach. That, that's one of, that's one. Marco likes art, you like art. Uh, we get very moved by art. So we, we, would, we would tend to go to museums because that is a way that I would affect me that I might affect the world in, in addition. So that's the technique that we use. But, you know, in, in contradistinction to what uh, science may tell us, and, I'm, and this, is why, this is why I always enjoy when, when, when you tell us things, uh, John, because I don't find them odd um, at all. <laughs> they, they, make, they make perfectly good sense to me. 
And I can understand how that might be, even if I can't myself explain how that might be. Um, I can't explain how and why um, these people who, who practice magic, I, I myself am not a practicing magician, though I have participated in, in magic rites, because it is an effective way also of getting in touch with oneself. Great, yeah. So, um, in 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 the in the purest sense of the word, and if we if we uh, take, and this is how I understand Gapes, and I think Gapes have got it. Um, the the most obvious, apparent, open, clearly visible magical act occurs every Sunday morning in every Catholic church all over the world. The 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 Roman Catholic Mass is is a magical act. It is, it is a precisely choreographed, sung, repetitious, focused movement and, 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 and verbalization, intoning, in order to bring about the actual substantial trans what's called transubstantiation, transforming a piece of bread into the body of Christ. And it happens when they ring the bell. Mm -hmm. That's when you know it happened. And it, and it is, that is magic. It and is. for those who are there, and for those who experience that, and for those who go through that and believe in that, that has a profound impact on their lives, their psyches, and what they do in the world every day. Now, obviously, our history has shown that not all of that is good. It can go very, very badly. But all of those people for whom that is doing it don't see this as being a magical act. But if I were to put it in, in magicians' terms, most of the magicians I knew were chaos magicians, they, they were doing what one would call left-hand magic, not, or black magic, not white magic, kind of thing. Right. Saying. So, so we, we have both ways. Kind of distinctions, but... But these are, these, are, these are real experiences that real people have, but they are also things that science, as we generally understand it, will simply not touch with a 10-foot pole. And, and I think that's it's the wrong way, approach to take because all phenomenon, regardless of what they are, are worthy of, of being looked at to, looked into and dealt with seriously. We need to take things seriously. And just and so, because you said, just because we don't happen to believe that things are a certain way doesn't mean that they're not that way. You know? <clears throat> I, my anger comes from my disappointment. I'm re I realize that every time I bring this up and I mention that because I expected something else, my expectations were violated. Well, okay. I, wish you, you, I wish you'd do me a favor and the next time you read this text and you blow your stack, you underline <laughs> it, share it with a group because I would like to know what happens right before you blow up and what happens well, after. Most of the time I go through here and I'm writing source, why, um, evidence, you know, I've, I've gone through again. Every time I see the word sphere, I circle it. He only mentions it six times. You know, we're in the third chapter. I don't think you need 900 pages to get a point across. You see, that's, that's the other thing. It's like, I, I happen to have a, a, a wonderful friend and a very odd friend as well. But he's one of those people that why say it in five words when 50 will do. You know, so and and so he becomes very verbose, and 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 the, he gets off into tangents, and I'm always trying to pull him back. He reminds me of Slo Sloterdijk is like his um, is like his evil twin. Yeah, yeah, he's he can get very grandiose. I grant you that, but that's part yeah. of his charm for me. Maybe well, yeah, and and I understand, I understand, I understand that part of it because. I also know a lot of people, this, this uh, other person, I love him dearly, he has an international organization and people hang on his every word, all 5,000 of them when they could have been 50, you know? And, and they, they do, and, 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 I, and I really appreciate that, that positiveness that these people exude when they do that. I don't have any negativity in that moment. It's just like, okay, well, can you get there a little quicker, you see? And, and I, 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 I spent years editing stuff that he wrote so that people could read it. <laughs> 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 
read 5,000 words, what 500 will do. <laughs> but trying to distill that essence, it's, it's a challenge. I understand that. Yeah. I, but, as, a, yeah. as a practitioner of uh, Ericksonian hypnosis, mm. I tell you what got me into it. Uh, I was about 30 years old. And I was in a in, in class, and we were working on age regression. I actually had some lots of experience of trance and meditation, and I was a body worker at that time. I was doing Reiki, uh, and I was having a lot of this weird stuff happening. Um, you know, I was taking on stuff from other people that I was working with, and I didn't know how to clear myself or ground myself. I was quite flooded by a lot of things. So I think he covers a lot of this in, in this chapter, people who are receiving some disturbances. But I, I got into this class, we were working on age regression, and they would, uh, they started with, I was 30, they took me back to 25, back to my early 20s, into, you know, just reporting a, on the, a learning experience that I had from those age. And when they hit 15, I immediately had this subjective experience, strong, kinesthetic, oh my God, my right leg is paralyzed. I can't move it. And the, they were a little disturbed. And I was like, well, I, I was in, when I was 15, I was in a back brace. I'd had an accident. Mm. When I was 13, um, playing football, I twisted my spine and tailbone and uh, uh, ripped out some ligaments and was paralyzed my right leg. Fortunately, I didn't do surgery. They were able to correct it with a back brace, which is a great benefit because I'm I recovered and I'm fine. But the point was that I could feel that I was paralyzed in my right leg. And I had totally forgotten about this experience. Mm -hmm. It was very pivotal. And then they moved me to the age of 13, right before the accident happened. And my leg was fine. Um, so reflecting on that episode, I started to realize that the body is time. Mm -hmm. Everything that has ever happened to your body is registered. I don't know where exactly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's something there that got my imagination going. And I started to investigate this. And I think a lot of our disease and pathologies are mislabeled and misnamed. They are, mm -hmm. they are uh, it's like our symptoms are frozen in a certain time and they want to thaw out. But instead of letting that happen, we bombard it with drugs we use these war metaphors. Immunology, the study of immunology is nothing but war metaphors. <clears throat> and I, I, what I think we end up doing is just uh, either we cut it out or we try to block it. its expression. Mm -hmm. And that's what's causing our chaos, I think, in our um, social worlds. Um, and I think hypnosis has a dark side and a dark history. There have been uh, some unsavory characters, Rasputin's out there, mm -hmm. and the Hitler's out there who've have misused it socially, but I still feel that uh, it's a very useful tool, and you and it's a may have a tremendous advantages, especially in the, in the arts. But I think in, to study it scientifically is a it's a very big challenge, especially if you're working with a deficient mental science, which says certain subjects are taboo. Mm -hmm. We're not going to look at why they're taboo. We just don't want to look at it at all. And these anomalies, I think, are creeping up over and over again in many different people's lives um, are forcing a lot of this, I think. I, I also think there's, like Gebser would say, I think that the integral is already here. That's why the mental deficient is so distressed. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're being pushed and pulled in many different directions. Um, part of us is still caught up in these mental deficient. I know I am. Mm -hmm. Almost everyone I know is caught up in it. Uh, we'd rather pop a pill than deal with all this going into regression and finding and contacting a source I we shut down. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just sharing this. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a personal anecdote that I would add to Dr. <laughs> research question about working with this patient. And what our author is exploring, um, because I think this is real pivotal chapter for me because I'm starting to get a sense of where he's coming from and where he may be going, um, because these are very large questions. And I don't think he's gotten all the answers, even, but the fact that he's putting it out there, I think is very valuable. And that we're doing this study group is very valuable. So thank you for letting me get weird. <laughs> 
I can assure you, John, you're not going to weird me out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you're going to have to try harder than that. <laughs> yeah. But there was a healing effect, I think, from yeah, I, exploring yeah, I, that. Going back into my past, that. something uh, got dislodged. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, my imagination <laughs> really run with this. Mm -hmm. These capacities we all have. I believe that. Can I add something? Oh, please. please. Yes, um, uh, I also suffered like at, at the first two or three chapters. I mean, I really suffered reading them. But yes, I mean, I, I was just reading chapter one and two and listening to you, everybody discussing. And then I said, maybe I didn't get it. and Maybe I have to go back. <laughs> but the thing is, I mean, um, in chapter three, and I read a few pages in chapter four, I think this is where I understood what he's trying to say. I mean, for me, the word bubble, uh, why did he choose the word bubble? He's try. I mean, for me, what I understood, he's trying to say we as um, uh, beings, we exist now. I felt that he's saying we exist like bubbles. And it's very sad for me because the lifespan of a bubble, the bubble is very fragile and the bubble is, you know, it can burst quickly. Uh, is our being that fragile? Um, also, um, the word spheres, um, are we isolated in different spheres in this modern world? And then he tries to make an argument, no, there is the self and the other. He's trying, I mean, this is how I felt when he puts this, the example of the heart from the Catholic, uh, one of the, uh, the, the Crusades, I think I remember yeah. this when I read it. And then I felt that his argument is that yeah, maybe we are living in spheres, but these spheres are interconnected. Maybe our group now, we are a life example of Slaughter that we are all different spheres, different bubbles, but we are interconnected. This is what I felt he's saying, like in this, um, in his example in chapter three, that this uh, connection between the, 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 um, um, the experience he mentioned between the patient and the uh, the magic, I can't remember what he called it because it was something for me, the magnetic or something like that. I mean, this relation between the self and the other, he's trying to say, yeah, we came from the womb, which is a sphere baby, which is a bubble. I don't know why he's using the, we were alone maybe in the womb, but, and then again, we were not alone because the mother was there and we were connected. And then we go back to other spheres and more and more and more spheres where we become more, more interconnected. I mean, regardless of the <laughs> examples, I, I mean, I wasn't interested in the history or uh, um, anthropology or gynology and he, what he was trying to say and the, the examples he was putting, but I wanted to see what, what he is trying to say. I mean, basically his basic idea is about the being, our being, um, how we come, how we, each one of us affect the other, affect our being starting from the womb where the mother affects the, 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 the baby inside the womb and then you go out to another sphere. I don't know, this is my reflection of the book so far. I think I have to read it more and more and to see what he's trying to, to say. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, if I can just throw this in, this is exactly why I'm still participating in this because those kinds of things get shared. I didn't see any of it. I didn't read that there. But I, oh. I do believe that you see that there. And I think it's important that you do. And I think it's important that I get to hear that you do. Mm. That's, that's the other side of it. Because I'm not getting that. So this is, this is very helpful for me, not necessarily in understanding Mr. Sloterdijk, but in perhaps being less angry with him the next time I went to <laughs> Because I actually, I say it, and we all we can all laugh about it, and I laugh about it as well. But it does bother me that I want to throw yeah. the book. You know, mm -hmm. it just it just it bothers me. You know, yeah. Why should yeah. I do that? Why does this guy get under my skin? So, th I thank you very much for that, because that's a, that's a prime example of what 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 keeps me going with this. It's not him. It's you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good information because I agree with you that there's something about 
sharing the confusion and the ambiguity that we can now like go back and reflect on our reading and saying, this is bullshit or mm -hmm. he's half baked here or yeah, he got that right, but he missed something else. So yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. very much about being critical thinkers yeah. and bouncing mm -hmm. ideas off of each other in different styles of learning. So, mm -hmm. and something about expressing it in a public space mm -hmm. is very yeah. creative rather than just staying in my library and trying to say, what the fuck is this all about? <laughs> I'm gonna go out and have a, have a beer and forget about it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a discipline, it's a discipline yeah. flow. No, it is, you know? yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Oh, okay, so I, I want to point go to a point of order. Uh, we're at uh, one twenty three my time, so uh, almost at ninety minutes. And uh, one thing that John had brought up in the forum uh, was that uh, it could be a good practice uh, to leave some time at the end of these calls to reflect on what we've learned or what perhaps what we could use uh, if, if we're looking to get something from these uh, uh, in, you know, in the rest of our lives. Um, and I want to leave a space for doing that uh, in, in, as a way of maybe completing or, uh, you know, closing the sphere, moving on to our next, our next sphere. Uh, and um, trying to also be generative with these calls uh, so that uh, however that the text is affecting us uh, we can share that uh, we can work it out uh, reflect to each other and come to some better understanding or greater spaciousness or whatever it is that we're going for and perhaps we haven't fully clarified exactly <laughs> what we're going for uh, or even what Sloterdijk is going for um, and I have a theory about that that I'm, I'm going to hold off on on introducing it, um, but uh, I, let, let me just leave some time for that. And I'll, I'll, I'll also, I'd also like to maybe reflect what I've learned, but I don't want to go first. Uh, so could we take uh, just a brief time each in whatever way we're able to summarize or make us- Just one thing, thing we may have learned, yeah. Yeah, one thing we may have learned and, and perhaps I'll frame my own response to that same question in a way that lets me introduce my 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 theory uh, and leave it at that see see how it, yeah. it it affects you or how it may um how it may come back later well yeah. i'm learning i i learned something maybe i'm not as weird as i feel that i am <laughs> if i can find one other weirdo then i'm not that weird you know? so that's a that's a good sign and i sort of want to cultivate <laughs> You're in the right. Not, weird, not, not weirdness for the sake of being weird or no. obtuse or no. obscure, no. No. but no. some. Let's face it, life is weird sometimes, mm -hmm. and finding a mm -hmm. public forum that can explore this in a way that's safe <laughs> and secure, mm -hmm. and I don't want to infect anybody with any thought viruses or anything. I don't need to do that because we already are pretty much infected. <laughs> um, but we can, I think, find a safe way of inoculating ourselves, and uh, you know ratcheting up our immune system so that we can detect a virus. Like uh, Donna Haraway said something beautiful, a virus can't fuck you up unless you invite it in. So I think there's something about that that needs to be registered. That when we see, when we see or hear or feel some sabotage going on, being able to alert ourselves to that in ourselves or in others can greatly uh, enhance I think his metaphor of immunity. And I feel like we've, I feel like I've participated in a womb-like experience here today. I, I even contacted some oceanic bliss. So I think we should go, keep, keep going in that direction. Thank, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I already had said that how I felt about what was going on from Donna's last comment, because that was very indicative of how things have, I've gone throughout this conversation that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm here to learn and I always do. I don't have to like what I'm learning. Most of the things that I learned in life, I don't like. Okay? <laughs> I, I also have a theory, an educational theory is that there are only two kinds of learning experiences. Aha. Uh -huh. I've had a couple of those and oh shit. And, <laughs> and, <okay. laughs> And I do that a lot. <laughs> this, That's awesome. Is, I like that idea. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I really like to keep things simple. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can't remember. And these are the opportunities because I like, like you, John, I think it's very important that you can say things that you can express yourself and that, you know, that even if people, they may think you are weird, they'll at least let you say it. You know, exactly. not being interrupted is a great stride forward. I find. Right. right. And this group is great. At, yeah. At and that's space. one of the things I like about this platform as a whole you can usually say what you want and people go, okay, he's a little weird, you know, but <laughs> it's all right, which is, which is good. You know, I think that's a great first step. You know. Okay. That's all I need. Uh, I'm going to go last, I think. Out, yeah. If I may. That was hard. Yes. <laughs> that would be one thing to do. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and Donna as well, if you'd like to. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I learned that I wasn't the only one suffering in the first future. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really happy now. <laughs> I thought I'm the only one <laughs> who didn't get it in the first two, three chapters. Yeah. Well, yeah. I still haven't got it. But <laughs> and maybe, yeah, maybe me, I, 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, we have to go through the whole book to see, and maybe we have to read the other two, three. <laughs> volumes yeah and still we might not get it <laughs> yeah. enough um interesting you know the one thing i took away from today again kind of like pulling it back to like, how can i apply this or use this is i found it interesting um i've been struggling with some of the imagery myself the whole oceanic mother centered going mm -hmm. back to that connection thing and i'm struggling with that and uh you know, based on what John was saying and what Donna was saying about like kind of like past life regression and going back, even with the example with the, the woman with the hat pin, I'm like, well, maybe there was something in my own past that's making me struggle with that, with that imagery that I'm just not aware of. Like, you know, it's just an image in a book and it's not like I haven't seen the art. It's not like I haven't, can't picture the idea of what this is, but why does every time I read it, I'm like, yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. And I just, I like, yeah, I just want to go to the next page. I'm like, okay, I got this moving on, you know? Um, maybe I'll investigate that a little bit more. And yeah. No past mm -hmm. life regret practitioners, but I'm sure there's some in my network somewhere because I've crossed paths with these folks. So just follow I'll, your dreams. I'll, I'll pick that up. Mm -hmm. Just just <laughs> write write it down yeah. before you go to bed. Yeah, go a dream journal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of information it. comes through your dreams at night. If you just write it down, a question or perplexity, yeah. it's amazing what comes through. Yeah. I will give it a shot. How many Thanks nights they're after you won't sleep either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess it's my turn. Yes, I, I want to say two words um, from this book, just for the record. Uh, one is psychocosmoerotology. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to learn what that is. <laughs> is there a real psychocosmoerotology? <laughs> That's what I'd like to know. Uh, the other is quasi pantheistic fluidal physics. Mm -hmm. And um, if nothing else, I mean, you would not you I think, me, encounter those words in, in another text. Uh, can so, you send me the page numbers of those? Oh, that's uh, page 223 <laughs> and 239 in the English edition. Uh, okay. I thought we just wanted to utter the words. For that's the, okay. uh, and that I, was didn't even, I, I didn't even enjoy it. Let me, let me try, utter them one more time to really enjoy it. Psychocosmo erotology yeah. and uh, quasi pantheistic fluidal physics. Well, I think what I'm learned from, from this call uh, is maybe not a learning, but a question that's come to mind, maybe a clarity of some perspective that, uh, that one might take on the book. Um, and I have to express that in the context of our other conversations, because we have previously, some, of, some on this call and who may be watching this video have previously read Gebser's The Ever-Present Origin. And we had a, a number of conversations uh, on that book. Uh, we read through it similarly <laughs> to how we're reading through this one. And uh, I, re I remember those experiences of having those conversations as being very fulfilling, uh, very joyful, actually. Uh, and e I would even say healing. Uh, and by that, I mean that, not, I don't mean that, but by that I mean that I actually physically felt better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
before and after, after the calls compared to before. So there was something that happened in the spaces that we had created and we co-created collectively, whoever showed up, we did two calls a week for um, eight, nine weeks. We went pretty fast, yeah. uh, but they, they were nourishing. They were fulfilling. I would leave feeling more energized. I left feeling, feeling better about life, feeling more positive, in general useful in that sense. And, and they were, we did talk about uh, many, many things uh, from including art, including the history of consciousness, uh, including literature and so forth and so on. So it had these mental interesting components to it, but there, were, there was also something about the space and the conversation and the dynamics that were allowed to unfold in those conversations that felt nourishing and fulfilling and meaningful. And, and I realized that that's what I want out of these conversations as well. I want to feel that. Now, how do we interpret what that feeling is? Sloterdijk is, is giving some ideas about how that could be interpreted, I think. Uh, and he's drawing on some historical examples, illustrating uh, maybe how we might understand the mechanics of uh, how a group forms in these bubble, bubbly ways and, uh, and how those groups potentially uh, collapse, break down, puncture, all the way, th th there's, there's a lot of dynamics that are, that are going on. And I think what I'm learning is that they're very specific to who's there, what they feel comfortable sharing, how, this, how the co collective space um, tr handles that, uh, receives it, uh, reflects it uh, back. Uh, that, all, that This is a practice, I think. Mm -hmm. And there is, insofar as we put some attention on the practice that we're doing together, we can create better uh, experiences. Uh, and what are those experiences? Um, part of what I think Sloterdijk is, is doing in this chapter is uh, pointing at least to some possibility that, that people could be in, this is what I think he's maybe not pointing to actually. I mean, but this is what I'm looking for in it, I should say. Uh, it is pointing to the possibility of, of how we do that, how people can do that, not just us specifically here, but maybe in, in general as well, in a way that is clear of uh, some of the limit, let's say the limitations of the mental view, the mental perspective, the psychotherapeutic um, uh, perspective or mechanistic uh, perspectives. But the question I have is, I mean, like all the things you guys share with me, uh, whether it's your paranormal experiences or personal experiences, uh, painting your, your, you know, your shed out you know, behind your house or encountering a past incarnation, I don't experience them as weird. I don't experience them as off limits to talk about. I don't see them as non-theoretical or anti-mental or anti what we're supposed to be talking about. And I wonder who Sloterdijk is actually talking to. I wonder if he's talking to us or if he's talking to some other people who have more of a problem with, um, with I, those. I would think you know, any, anyone in academia would have a problem with what he's talking about. I mean, the academics are prone to throwing people out for expressing anything about the paranormal. I mean, it's just... So that's what I wonder. Is it, is it is the part of the frustration that, yeah, we get it. You don't have to prove to us that it's legitimate to talk about, uh, right. to talk in many different ways about the, these interspatial, inter, you know, these intersubjective types of experiences and these experiences of time in the body. We're, this is not weird. To, to, uh, I think he have, may have multiple audiences that he's trying to address. I mean, there may be professional philosophers. There may just be people like me who's just curious, you know, and has mm -hmm. interest in therapy and psychology. And there may be anthropology. There's some cultural anthropology he's doing. Uh, I, I agree. It's sort of hard to define what he's doing. And he's not presenting, I think, rigid, I mean, uh, rigorous uh, arguments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, but I'm, I'm also like, well, what's philosophy anyway? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think he's mm -hmm. okay with that. Those kind of readers who, who are okay with not knowing um, where he's going with this, because it's highly speculative philosophy, that's for sure. But I do think there is a reason why he's hymns and haws and obfuscates maybe, because he's a little 
scared. Because, um, you know, he could be blasted by a lot of people. The Daniel Dennett's of the world are out there and they are in power in a lot of places. I don't think they are a large majority of the human population. I doubt very seriously that they're having that big an impact, but they are in academia. And I, I look at some of the shit they write and it's horrible. It's just really horrible crap that totally rubs me the wrong way because I've experienced no, the world in I'm radically the different ways. That that it, it, and I've been pushed out of these groups. You know, yeah. I've been told to shut up and sit down, pick a number, yeah. whatever. Oh, yeah. And I think he's had that. He's very sensitive to that. So I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. I know you um, hadn't finished, but I just had this strong response to what you well, were saying. Well, that's, that's really what I wanted to ask. I wonder, uh, you know, coming from the Gapeser, Gapeser reading, I wonder if he's really speaking to the mental structure more so than the in he wants to speak to the integral perhaps but he has to work through the mental and right. part of the way he's doing that is going back to fundamental experiences and telling a tracing a story of how we've come how we or who, who who we is i'm not sure but how we've come to limit our sense of reality uh to the um mona Lod to the individualistic to the mechanistic uh, to the rash, the deficient mental. Uh, he may be getting to that, uh, but without as clear a sense of what the integral is uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the way that G G Gibbs or others uh, would lay it out. And so insofar as each book forms its own spheres of through the readership that, that uh, the books create, something he writes about as well, uh, then... Uh, <laughs> Some readers may just be a lot more comfortable in, this, in, in, in spheres that he is not necessarily, uh, uh, but, but he's friendly to. I mean, that's the sense that I get. He is friendly to, to, to them. He was and, in a cult. <laughs> Osho, Ra Rajneesh. Oh, okay. He was a okay. member of that cult. Oh, he, that's very he, interesting. I heard uh, he, in an interview, he talked about this. So that's he's very, not he, a beginner. <laughs> the, cult, the cultic dynamics is one of the themes of this chapter. We didn't really talk too much about it, but the magnetic uh, effects of the magnetizer and the magnetized and how the magnet, mag, the, that magnetism can subsume uh, in, uh, the autonomy of, of right. the individual and how part of healing involves recovering uh, uh, what we might call a healthy autonomy mm. uh, or an integrated autonomy. Uh, so that one can be in exchanges with others without being subsumed uh, in them completely, uh, but also point noticing how we seek being to, to be subsumed, uh, if not in the other, then in uh, or in the womb, the oceanic bliss, then in the ultimate, in the absolute, in God, the divine, or in con consciousness itself, or how so many different ways of of seeking uh, to be. Uh, taken into something bigger than oneself. Uh, and certainly a group like this is one way of doing that as, as well. Uh, our individual isolated selves are relaxed a little bit insofar as we could share them uh, with others and be received in an exchange. And so uh, I, I, I guess that I, I'm noticing that we're going through the, we're going through very concrete layers of how, how we might do that uh, from the, interfaciality for, for let even just starting starting um well well the first starting with the heart and the heart space is like, that something we can feel right we all can feel that right and we can feel that the exchange of that i think uh non-locally uh the face interfaciality that's something that is we can pay attention to and now then this way of it, this effective infections is another thing that we could pay attention to in a group like this and notice the ways that our expectations around what it means to be face to face, what it means to, uh, to speak from the heart or to have a heart to heart uh, and what it means for our words to be magical, to have effects uh, and for us to be in trance states, maybe to always be in some trance or another, some kind of trance uh, as we move from bubble to bubble. <laughs> How are those forces uh, in play uh, in, our, in our interactions. Uh, that is very interesting to me. And ha being able to explore that is really what I want to do. Want mm -hmm. to do. Uh, so I appreciate that you, you <laughs> the expectation that I had at the beginning and the hope, the desired outcome I, I had was that you participated. And 
You so did. you got your desired outcome? I did. Great. We're making progress here. <laughs> so I thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have to say something to Ed. The, the quote was from page 247 in the yeah. English translation. I mean, yeah. It'll be close in the German. The, the pages are very close this time. It's not like with Gapeser that they were off by God knows how much, but they're relatively close. It's usually within one or two pages of whatever you have. I can find whatever it is that you uh, refer to. I, I like to do that because just like, you know, I, I really appreciated that Marco brought up a couple of these, these coinages that, that, that he is wants to strew through the text because when you when you in german when you start making up words the normal i think the everyday reaction is this guy has no idea what he's talking about or he just say it because germans are very direct people and what he writes is anything but direct so i i appreciate that he is writing for other audiences or for his academic audience or for his you know, if you if you are a professor at a university, then you are primarily writing for your colleagues, wherever they may be worldwide. Um, Germans tend to be more critical of their own, but they have a tradition that 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 he probably was the last to experience it, though I haven't really seen it in him. Uh, Marco brought up a, a really fascinating word very early in our conversation when he was talking about Fichte in this whole initiate priest, the priest um, professor relationship in initiatic. Uh, there was a time in this country, um, well, let me phrase this differently. In the United States, you always say where you got your degree. It's important that you say I have my, my, my BA from Harvard and my master's from Yale and I did you know, graduate work at Berkeley or whatever. The, the school determines what I think you're worth, even though it's bullshit, you know, <laughs> because no, you, you, if, once you get into an Ivy League school, you know, jo- George Bush has a, B, a BS from Yale and an MBA from Harvard, but he exhibited nothing in what he said or did that reflected any of that. So like, why do I care? But if you are in that elite school, you get passed. I, I almost flunked out of my bachelor's. I, I barely made it through. I, I'll, I'll admit that. Because I could have been flunked out. George Bush never could have been. He is going to leave with a C bachelor's, period. You're there, you get it, done. So what does that tell us about anything? Nothing. But I'm one of these people that I don't think grades tell us anything because they don't. You know, you can get an A somewhere, and I've known I've known people. When I did my in the German university. It's different than it's based German on the university. Person. Yeah, in a German university, it used to be. It's not that way anymore. But when I went through, there was only the exam at the end, and you did you did you wrote. Like in my master's, I wrote my master's thesis. I got a, a grade on it. I wrote, I had to do a, a one hour oral in my major. I had to do a half hour oral in each of my minors. Mm. And those grades were put together and I came up with a grade. And how I got there and what I took and whether or not, there were very, very few requirements. There were very few graded courses. A graded course meant I had to write a paper and it was generally pass fail. And I had to submit before I could even go to my exams, I had to make an application to the examination office that I felt qualified to be examined. And they reviewed all of this and said, okay, well, we'll let you do that. And then they gave me a topic for my master's thesis. Hmm. I had already agreed upon that topic with the professor who was going to read it. You also have to agree with them what you're going to write about. Master's thesis in Germany is probably generally 50, maybe 75 pages long. Mine was 700. Yeah, close your eyes, Wendy. 
I'm reading okay. Slaughter Dyke, and I'm thinking this is a big book. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's why. I have a lot of sympathy for people that say things, a lot of work. Yes, but I did something in my master's thesis that most people don't do. The thing is, at that time, whenever you wrote your thesis, it was announced to all the faculties in the university, and two, two copies had to be present, present in the institute where you did it, because any professor from anywhere in the university could come and read it and go, I don't like it, this is shit, you don't get a degree. Done. You didn't even get to your orals. Wow. You see? Anybody could do that. But, so, having a grade in the end doesn't really mean a lot. Um, Werner Heisenberg, who won the Nobel Prize in physics, three years after he got his doctorate, failed his doctorate the first time around because his doctor father, as we call the supervisor, didn't feel he had the capacity for abstract thinking. He's the father of the uncertainty theory. You go, know, okay, yeah, how abstract can you get? You know. <laughs> <laughs> and the other people on the committee begged this guy to give him another chance. And so he finally, okay, we'll let him through. But you'll never find out from a German in Slaughterdikes that way, too. He studied in Munich and somewhere, and he's in Karlsruhe now. Because it wasn't, it wasn't where you studied. It was with whom you studied. Right. And it was, it was very almost initiatic. The professor I studied with at Gießen was a student of Gadamer, who was a student of Heidegger. There, there's my lineage. Mm. I have an initiatic lineage, right. <laughs> you see. But, and for John, in the Magus side of things, there's a whole world beside that where there are lineages, initiatic lineages of things, of what you can and cannot do and who right. has said, I think it's okay, you see. And, and, and none of that ever gets mentioned anywhere because those are things that science and our humanities don't really deal well with but but this is how this is how a german scholar would see himself and that's why you always say oh yes they uh, you know fichte studied in uh, berlin hamburg and and in uh, bonn okay and then you can look at that time well who was there when and then you know who he was dealing with right and you kind of know what he's he's doing you know dennett Dennett, for example, studied at Oxford with Gilbert Ryle. In the English universities, it was very much the same way. He studied with Gilbert Ryle. If you haven't read Ryle, don't try to understand Dennett. It's not, gonna, it's not really going to come. You're going to struggle to no end because you don't know who his, where his lineage comes from. And that was all of these things that I found extremely <laughs> rich and rewarding about, about studying here because it wasn't where did you go and which boxes did you get ticked. It really meant, and the thing is, if you're going to be a doctoral student in Germany, it's not like you make an application and fill it out and they say, okay, I, went, I was in a doctoral program at an English university and you have to fill out something and they tick the check and whatever and interview and blah, 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 and then okay, you get assigned to these people as your supervisors or whatnot. You had to find someone who would take you. And if they said, no, you didn't. I know lots of people who never got doctors because nobody would take them on. Yeah. yeah, you had to find somebody who was willing to be your doctor father or doctor mother. It was, it was, it was actually a, a birth well, into, a, into a new life, if you will. Well, well, I just want to respond to that because you yeah. really... Um, um, triggered something in me. I think it's important that we know when we've, we've been triggered because I'm a college dropout. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an, I came to, I got into theater and I started my own theater group rather mm -hmm. than go to college. It was a very wise decision. And I got in, into the nonprofits. I worked in museums. I did all kinds of stuff. Um, but I think the, uh, so I'm not coming from an, an academic, um, I'm not, I don't care about it. I just read anything I want to read. You know, and I'm not going to, there's no pop quiz and I don't care, but I'm very studious and I work really hard. Yeah. And I think that what we're in the, in the middle of is a transition from what you're describing with all mm -hmm. of its good, good sides and bad sides. Um, 
we were doing something else now. I think we're moving into, and I think the need for transdisciplinarity is really crucial. I know that's a buzzword, mm -hmm. but I can be an expert in something and I may be a very begin a beginner in something else and mm -hmm. vice versa. You may be a beginner in some area I'm expert at and, and you may have expertise in some, and we need to find a way. Beginners and experts need to be able to sit at the same table and mm -hmm. come up with ways of investigating that allows me to be a beginner mm -hmm. and allows you to be the expert. Mm -hmm. well, you, don't, you don't have to dumb anything down and I don't have to be reduced to a, a beginner and therefore I have nothing to say. So I think we have, that's what I think the struggle is right now for me mm -hmm. uh, in these forums um, because uh, there's some things I'm very good at and I, I'm an expert at hypnosis. I know a lot about this. So I can respond as an expert in this particular area. Other areas, I'm a total beginner or a novice, but that's okay. I think the important thing is, can we ask relevant questions of one another? Yes. And then we can start moving towards this idea of, of transdisciplinarity. Right now, I think that, the, that what you've described in academia is just so destroying everything. I mean, mm. our, our knowledge sharing is getting less and less and less because of this specialization and this, and this political uh, arena that most academics work in. So anyway, that's, that's how I was triggered by what you were saying, because I've been left out many, many yes. times. Yes. I've been thrown out of the village, you know, when, when they were throwing rocks. And I, I've oh, had that experience. I, I know lots of us have. And I think those learning, those inhibitions are, uh, go very deep. And we have to have the courage, I think, to articulate that and move on, because we all have a lot to share. And we, you know, we may not have a, a infinite amount of time to figure this out. I feel we need to create some momentum. That to me is very important. Um, that uh, the momentum of the, the, these sessions, what happens between sessions, we somehow keep that going. Because I think we, I know I need a deadline. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a deadline, I'll say, who cares? You know, but yeah. if I have a deadline, I get a little anxious, you know? And I think that's a good thing about school. So if there are enough deadlines there, you sort of meet the mark. And, but I think we need to find other ways of motivating ourselves. Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much for that because it helped me sort of. We, we do, John, because yeah. deadli deadlines are, if you wait to the last minute, it only takes you a minute to do it. That's all I right. say. <laughs> and, and, and what we do online is fun. I like our company. This is just a minute. But, but you, bring up, you bring up a very important point. I, I firmly believe, and, th and this, this is the corollary to what I just said, if you never had any academic training or ever had attended a seminar or visited a, anything, but you found a person that you said, I want to look at this, will you do it? Then you could become a doctoral student for that professor without having a degree, without having anything. That's been taken away because now we have a very formalistic system where you have to tick the boxes, go through, jump through the hoops, set some of them on fire and do that whole thing. So I think, I think Germany had a, an, an excellent education system and they blew it right. because they got rid of it. The, the other side of it, because I find this a very interesting, would you said, well, I'm a college dropout. Everybody that was anybody in the entire computer industry, which is completely driving all of us insane today, <laughs> the dropout. Every single one. There wasn't one of them. <laughs> Not a single one who had anything to do with it yep. who was academically qualified. <laughs> that is something we also need to keep in mind because right. that's driving our entire existence, but it's the academics that are telling us how it is that it's affecting us. Right. And that's why I'm very skeptical of experts. But I know it's hard to believe, but I have a little bit of an authority problem. <laughs> All right. Speaking of deadlines, I have, I have another. I have yeah, another boy, uh, we go over this time. <laughs> that's okay, but I, I, I have, I have to finish reading for another group later. Uh -huh. um, this is the, the Shantaram book, uh, which is really amazing, yeah. actually. Uh, and I hope we. I didn't get to bring in some of the fiction over that I wanted to connect. Uh, spears with bubbles Make with but I'll do that next time yes uh, it was a little story about a well I won't even go into it. a mutant uh, a mutant uh, boy with flippers uh, who becomes a guru uh, and attra attracts uh, this massive followers that follows around their uh, their traveling carnival and part of the, the initiation into the cult of uh, 
of uh, Arturo the Aqua Boy, this is from the book Geek Love mm -hmm. by Catherine Dunn, is that these followers have to cut off bits of their limbs incrementally until they approximate the beatified state of the mutant uh, fish boy. Uh, and so he has all of these uh, followers who take off, you know, fingers, toes at first until they go through their entire, their hands, their, uh, you know, until they're, they're limbless. Uh, and that, that becomes the beatified. This Is this the geeks? Is this the geek? Yeah. Geek love. Geek no, love. I, have, I, I had that, I to read that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just thought it was an interesting reflection on this uh, sort of guru phenomena and yeah. Uh, the the initiatory process into these you know spheres and how how they can in some cases at least as this book was exemplified uh, be at the expense of uh, one's natural capacities and uh, mm -hmm. abilities as a human being yeah. uh, so I wonder if in some cases what we're asked asked of to be part of certain spheres or to be connected to certain lineages or gurus or, or what have you uh, is a lessening of ourselves in order to uh, experience this kind of greater unity, uh, mm -hmm. which may or may not be uh, illusory, uh, may or may not be functional. Um, but uh, it, it is interesting to notice when that kind of thing is, is, being, yes. is happening and perhaps is even being asked of us, like what's the cost of being in your sphere? Uh, what mm -hmm. part of myself do I have to cut off? Uh, oh, and well, That'll be an interesting topic of discussion. Yeah. <laughs> it gives us pause to think. Yes. It gives us Anyhow, I guess I did make that connection. Um, and uh, I do have to go. So okay. thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Happy trails to you, everybody, with the book. Yeah. <laughs> what a pleasure. So uh, same time, two weeks from now. Uh, okay. Back. Uh, I'll give it another go. I, I was wondering, well, are we going to continue doing this? I think we should. <laughs> Let's get through the book. This is okay, my I'll try. This is my, my <laughs> you can do it, Ed. I'm enjoying it. I like the book. So <laughs> it's, it's fairly. It's not. It's not really a lot of reading either. I, yeah, I, you know, I, I read it today, and I more or less, you know, felt ready to talk about it. So um, let's let's uh, carry forth. Um, all right. All right. See you all later. Bye, everyone. Bye.